U.S. is 25% of the diamond engagement ring market. And so this, by Signet Jewelers, this is like what they said in their um, latest report, they COVID disrupted the dating cycle. So like no one's buying engagement rings this year, but they expect more engagement ring sales in 2024 because of, because of the dating cycle is interrupted. So right now, jewelry prices are driving and jewelry demand is driving the diamond price. But, you know, as it gets financialized, that, that will change. And that's one of the reasons why it's not correlated to anything. It's most correlated to U.S., um, you know, personal consumption expenditure, actually. Back to the Future's Edge podcast. I'm Jim Murio. As always, brains behind the operation, Bob Icino. Today we have Amelia Bordeaux, who is the managing director and market strategy of Diamond. What's it called? Diamond Standard. Diamond Standard. I can't even read my own writing. Now is that is that a new <laughs> is that a new endeavor? It's a new endeavor for me. But the Tell company's been it. around um, since like before 2020, about. Uh, Diamond Standard created the world's first regulated diamond commodity. So its founder and CEO is Cormac Kenny, and he is the behind all of uh, creating this this diamond commodity. So I maybe should show you one, just so you can kind of before I start to talk about it, you probably need the visual. So here we go. That is the bar, the diamond commodity, and this is um, the coin. So is this part of your compensation? Is that why we're looking at that right <laughs> now? Like, and then yeah. just so you can see too, it's on it's a tokenized, so it's on the they're on the blockchain. So um they're diamonds encapsulated in in resin. That's the commodity with a computer chip, which you know basically tokenizes it, puts it on the blockchain, and all the information about these diamonds are stored on the blockchain. So you can is, can is every it. one of those diamonds um similar in clarity, cut, size? Perfection. Well, that was the tough part, right? That's why diamonds uh, so far until now have never been financialized, you know, like a bar of gold. Yeah, you can think about this kind of like a, a bar of gold. So what Cormac's breakthrough was um, in inventing the diamond commodity was what you're referring to is that standardization. So because diamonds obviously have the four C's, color, cut, clarity, carrot, um, they're all different from each other. There's over, like, he figured out 16 million combinations of, you know, the diamonds. And so what he set out to do and what he did was he standardized them. So through a process of bidding, we have an electronic diamond market, an automated market feature that we go out and we buy, you know, 10,000 diamonds, say, a week. And they range and the whole range of diamonds from like 94% of the above ground geologically, you know, gem quality diamonds we buy through a bidding process, which, you know, forces price discovery. And then those are standardized, right? So through an optimization process, they're grouped and each one of these bars and coins. So the diamonds aren't exactly the same in each coin, say, but they're gemologically equivalent to each other. And that's the standard. They set the standard or exceed it every coin. And so they're fungible. That's what makes it a commodity. They're good for settlement uh, and good for delivery on um, CME Globex. So, so there, you're saying there's a futures contract, or you just there is going to, to be no. We're working on that. So right now mm -hmm. there's a spot market, and we're working on futures options and an ETF. So, so getting the the futures contract will be big. When you say they're on the blockchain, I mean obviously. Mm -hmm. Most people that right away, well, I shouldn't say for most people, for some people that means right away that fraud is nearly impossible for other people. They don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. So explain what that means, because the first thing that a cynic I'm sure would say is mm -hmm. how do we know those are even diamonds in there, let alone that mm -hmm. one bar is equivalent to the other. How, to me, it yeah. would seem the blockchain is, is the way that they guarantee that, but can you explain it better than I could? Yeah, there's a couple of ways. So, we created a, a digital diamond exchange where all the dealers are KYC. So there's like 185 dealers around the world. These are from the major diamond centers, you know, Mumbai, Antwerp, Hong Kong, right? 
So these are known diamond dealers, they're KYC'd, their background check, they're put on the exchange. So they can't sell us any diamond that isn't GIA certified. So but we bid, we buy a diamond. The diamond is shipped from wherever it is in the world, not to us at Diamond Standard. Diamond Standard headquarters are, are located 46 and 5th, the Diamond District in New York City. They aren't delivered to the actual company. They're delivered to IGI, which is another greater. And IGI is across the street from <laughs> Diamond Standard, right in the Diamond District in, in Manhattan. And so they regrade the diamond. So the, the two main diamond graders in the world are GIA and IGI both grade each diamond for us. It'd be amazing if they graded it differently and that would be really good for whatever one did, caught a mistake, but that typically isn't the case. And then um, IGI assembles um, the the diamonds. And then to get back to your point, um, the diamond commodity, they assemble them, we do not assemble them. So to get back to your point, it's on the blockchain. So all of these kind of, these purple dots here, those are all the GIA, those are all the certificates for all the diamonds. And then when you can look up your token, you can bring it up and you can see all the certificates for the diamonds that are in your commodity. There's a couple ways to invest. I can get to that. But some people hold the physical commodity, like the actual commodity. <laughs> Most deliver it, have it delivered to Brinks. So we have a vault in Delaware with Brinks. So if you have it delivered there, there's no tax because it's Delaware. And um, when you hold it in Brinks, um, if you want to trade it, you would just trade the blockchain token. You would just exchange tokens on our spot market with whoever wanted to buy it. So you don't have to move the actual physical commodity. It just remains in the vault that brings you exchange the token. Amelia, so walk us through what either the coin or the block, because I'm I'm very I'm fascinated by this. What <laughs> type of diamonds, and again, I know a little, not a lot. What type of diamonds are in there? And what if I was to invest in that and bring it home? What's that going to cost me? You can go on Bloomberg, D-I-A-M-I-N-D-X. We have an index. So that's what these are. You can check it on Refinitiv or Bloomberg. So the coin is today is $4,850. And then the bar is always 10 times that. So $48,500 about. So Okay. So in the coin, there was it looked like there was about five diamonds. No, there's eight. So they vary. They can vary. Maybe there'll be nine and one or eight, you know, but they're all gemologically equipped to each other. Okay. And what's the average size of those? Care? So in the coin, yeah, the combined, the di the bar and the coin have represent uh, statistically 94% of all above ground diamonds. So they're, they range in from 0.18 to 2.05 carats and they're color scale D uh, to O and L1 to flawless. So that, and that's 94% of all above ground gem quality diamonds statistically. So. Um, okay, one more for me, Bobby, then, then I want to pass, just get you in here too. Lab grown diamonds are a thing. Yeah. Can a jeweler spot the difference between a lab grown diamond and a real diamond immediately? How does that even work? A diamond grader can. So to, yeah, lab growns are all the rage and they're all the rage and very controversial like within the diamond industry right now. So if you want to talk more about that, that's a really exciting conversation. To just the naked eye, you know, lab grown diamonds are, are diamonds. You can't tell them apart from a natural stone, but if you bring them to a grader, you know, they're immediately a parent with their equipment. And the reason why is because obviously a natural diamond takes thousands of years to form and a lab grown diamond can be grown over like two weeks to three weeks in a lab. And so molecularly the structure is quite different from each other. And when you get them under that microscope, it's quite apparent that it's a, it's a lab grown. So you said most people will just kind of store them in the vault and then trade uh, tokens to kind of get in and out and collect their gain or their loss. Is there a cost to store similar to gold where you got to kind of factor that into how much you've made or lost? Yeah, there is custody fees at Brinks. Um, I don't have them with me. They're, they're pretty I, minimal. I don't need, I'm just curious. Yeah, there, there are custody fees at Brinks. It's just compared to storing gold. I used to work. I used to work at UBS. At the time, it was one of the world's largest gold traders. <laughs> right. And I was I was on the FX desk, but I sat people next to me were the gold desk. They started the gold desk. And so just hearing them in all the ways, like physical gold had to be moved and stored and certainly put in the vaults in Zurich at UBS and everything that went into that and all the costs, I mean, it's quite expensive, trust me. So, um, you know, this is much less expensive because these are so, the value is so dense and the diamonds are so small. The commodity is so small relative to, to gold. So in reference to going back to the comparison to gold, because I mean, obviously anybody watching this to this point 
And I mean, we could probably do a whole show on this. I do want to get like your opinion on markets because that's right. something that Jim and yeah. I have both come to respect your opinion of at a really high oh, level. Thanks. Some people buy silver because gold has too high of a price. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Which I've always thought was a silly way to do things. But 48000 and 4800 mm -hmm. you know, right now, somewhere around two and a half times or one and a half times the price of gold, uh, multiples of the price of silver. Mm -hmm. What would be, well, first of all, are there, is there plans for fractionals since it's tokenized? Maybe there potentially could be fractionals or do they yeah. exist already? Or right now, are we talking bar coin, lower middle class people go to hell? We don't care. No, there's a few answers to your question. So <laughs> there, I you know so it's, we, we have a lot going on at Diamond Standard. Cormac is yeah. a extremely genius Cormac. We haven't really announced it yet, but Cormac has spoken about it publicly and, and an announcement will most likely be coming in the fall. But these are also going to be asset-backed currencies, and that's where your fractionalization comes in to, to question, you know, because when you have a Bitcoin, it's not actually backed by an asset. And a stable coin is, um, says they're funded one for one, but they're who not. knows? Yeah. They, they're you know, not. They don't, yeah, right. Like they don't, they, they disclose with a giant lag, the, uh, yeah. the underlying assets. They don't tell you where they are. They don't tell you where to custodying them. And nobody so it, remembers yeah. trading with them, which is also weird. Yeah, a ahead. lot of weird things. But this, when you're fractional, yes, it will be fractionalized. Um, it'll become an asset backed digital currency. Mm -hmm. But another way to invest is we have a fund. So a lot of people through their invest retirement accounts um, can't hold physical commodities. So we do have a fund. It's co-managed with Horizon Kinetics that holds the physical and you would invest in the fund and be shares that that fund is audited by with them. So and as I said, co-managed by Horizon um, Kinetics. And I should probably get back a little bit to the investment thesis. So people right now aren't, we have a spot market, but they're not really trading in and out of it. And the reason is, is because this is kind of, I consider my own opinion, a strategic investment currently. It's kind of like an alts investment. You know, you want to put it to the side. It has low vol, it's uncorrelated because it's not financialized yet. So there's like no correlation with anything, with any other asset class. And so as we plan and as we move forward to, you know, into the, futures options ETF to financialize it, you will start, you know, a position build. Some we think of this similar to when GLD uh was launched in 2004. And then the the position build and the um you know the trajectory up in the gold price when when that was launched. And so that ETF would in theory ahead would make it you know much more much easier for all types of investors to to invest as well so i consider this a like a three-year strategic hold where you probably wouldn't want to trade it in and out of it right now you'd probably want to hold it till we get to that etf and hopefully see that appreciation bobby i, I want to get to markets too but i'm so involved yeah, yeah, in the whole like we this may not get to markets fascinating <laughs> to me yeah. too. and i'm wondering tell and tell your boss too if he's you know, looking for maybe a way to expose his product to a group of uh, hard money type financial enthusiasts and traders. We might have some ideas for him. But anyway, yeah, I love um, <laughs> so what, let's talk about the price of diamonds over time. Does it track really like gold and silver? Like, is it a liquidity trade? If there's, if M2 money supply is going <laughs> through the roof like it was, does mm -hmm. that money flow into diamonds? Or is it if, if countries seem like they're going to collapse and people rush to buy portable physical assets, what affects the price of diamonds? So right now, 98% of above ground diamonds are in jewelry. So the jewelry market in the luxury goods market impacts um, is what impacts the price of diamonds right now. So consumer spending, the United States is 60% of the world diamond market. Um, and China, China and India combined are around like 20 and in rising. So during the pandemic, when, you know, people were spending on goods because they couldn't spend on services, uh, kind of like Peloton bikes, um, you remember during the pandemic, like luxury goods took off, right? In yeah. 2020, 2021. And that's what happened to the price of diamonds. It just, it was like a generational event where people were just sitting at home buying diamond jewelry, apparently, just like they were buying really expensive handbags and Peloton bikes. And it just went up. And now the diamond prices are kind of coming down, um, not below their baseline, um, but they're reverting back to 2019 levels. And the other thing to know about diamond jewelry currently is U.S. is 25% of the diamond engagement ring market. And so this, by Signet Jewelers, this is like what they said in their um, latest report, they COVID disrupted the dating cycle. So like no one's buying engagement rings this year, but they expect 
more engagement ring sales in 2024 because of, because of the dating cycle is interrupted. So right now, jewelry prices are driving and jewelry demand is driving the diamond price. But, you know, as it gets financialized, that, that will change. And that's one of the reasons why it's not correlated to anything. It's most correlated to U.S., um, you know, personal consumption expenditure, actually. So I went to the website earlier, and one of the things that struck me is, I'm going to throw a couple of things at you. A eh? Number one was, uh, diamonds essentially are uncorrelated. Now, I'm getting the numbers yeah. from Diamond Standards website. Okay, so I, I haven't double-checked these. I don't even know how I would. But when I was at my fund of funds, and, you know, we were managing money, we were always looking for non-correlated assets, which essentially we looked mm -hmm. at as being plus or minus 25 or lower. Mm -hmm. We actually went 20. Okay, so negative correlation of 20 or less, positive correlation of 20 or less, that's uncorrelated as far as we were concerned. And looking down this thing, the only thing that's even close is the Dow Jones, which has a negative 20 correlation. Yeah. I was shocked that the luxury of diamonds is not correlated positively to stocks. I was shocked by that. NASDAQ is negative 16. And this is three years, man. This is 2020 to 2023. So it's during the pandemic when luxury goods were exploding, right? Yeah. And the value of diamonds went up. Yeah. Obviously, there was a huge dip in NASDAQ at that point, which might have screwed up these correlations. I don't know. But do you have any explanation for why, at least for that three-year period, they'd be uncorrelated? And I know you haven't been there 10 years. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, you let me come back next week. I don't care. This is fast. No, it's okay. I have a couple of thoughts. Maybe I will come back next week. Yeah. But first of all, you can check this. You can check these correlations by, I go onto my I have Bloomberg's, I go onto Bloomberg and we, it's the diamond index is there, the price index, D-I-A-M, I-N-D-X. And okay. you just throw it into a Bloomberg correlation matrix with whatever asset classes you want. And you look at the, the years, you can do three years or 20 years, the correlation will come up so you can test it uh, for yourself. But yeah, it's interesting that luxury goods really went up in price. And so, you know, it wasn't, we don't have that correlation with the diamond index, I think because it's not very liquid, right? So first of all, it's not, you know, we're, it doesn't have any intraday trading. So it's only like one price per day. You can't, you can come on the spot market anytime you want and trade it, but it's not like an intraday moving you know, asset class where it responds to headlines or anything well, like that. I, you know, I look at this and I think to myself, okay, stocks collapsed during the pandemic and luxury goods went up because yeah. the wealth effect, the wealth gap right, increased wealth effect, during yeah. that period of time. And it would make sense to me that the correlations would change over that three-year period from what they normally are. So have you put in like 20 years in your boom? I don't have Bloomberg. Maybe one of you two guys can do it and yeah, send it another Yeah, we have a 20-year. I can send it. We have a 20-year. It's not too different because it's so low vol it doesn't okay. move a lot um the thing that i noticed because i was actually looking at this i think as opposed to putting it against an entire indice like dow jones or s&p if you choose another luxury like if you choose lvmh or you choose a pandemic stock like peloton i looked yeah. at it against peloton and i didn't do a correlation but they were co-moving it was like if you can think of something that was bought and go to that one company during the pandemic and put it against the diamond index i it, it may correlate over that period but it would be like you know lmbh or Wishmont stock it wouldn't be like the whole s&p 500 you said you had a 20 year do you have any and if you don't know the answer to this, that's fine too but if you look at the last 50 100 years what are like the top five drawdowns in the price of diamonds? Have they ever we, collapsed to the tune of 50% or no? We only have the index. It only goes back to 2002. So, so what's the biggest the biggest down move they've had in that time? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure, but our base is 4,500. That's the low price. We're at 48, like 50 today. So um, we're just kind of reverting back to those pre-pandemic so levels. A lot of it depends also not on, not only, of course, not only on demand, but also on supply. And so there are occasional supply shocks in the diamond industry right now. There's obviously sanctions on El Rosso, which is the world's largest producer of diamonds. Just in general, from another like standpoint of the diamond market supply in terms of mining companies, I'm a new diamond mind of significance hasn't been found in, in two decades. So over time, you know, the next five years, mines are coming offline. So natural diamonds are, um, the supply will be steady to diminishing. It will not be rising. So that's Bobby, this is for you. And I want to see if you yeah. think I'm tracking this right. Because if I think of diamonds, I think of diamonds, 
artwork, fine wine, um, to, to like to invest in luxury things, like things like people store money in the ultra uber wealthy store money. You can't really standardize artwork and wine, but right. you can attempt to standardize these diamonds. So I'm intrigued as hell by this whole concept. You as well? Yes. I'm a naturally cynical person and if things keep popping in my no. head because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't you like haven't done treating for... floors that were cynical. Yeah, exactly. Honestly, God, I didn't like Jimmy for about 12 years. So we just got <laughs> to the point it. where it balanced out the years I hated him to the years I like him. But I, I look at it from a perspective the same way that I, I remember I was sitting in WGN studios in Chicago, Jimmy, right? And they had asked me on to defend Bitcoin. And I never knew my, that I needed to defend Bitcoin. It wasn't kind of my role, but they asked me on to do that. And I can't remember the name of the host, but he was like, criminals love Bitcoin. And I said, you know, empty your pockets right now. And he pulls out a wad of cash. I go, criminals love that too. Okay. So I don't understand <laughs> why, that, you would, right? why that would bother you with Bitcoin when criminals right now, they exist on cash. Diamonds have been the illegal good transport of criminals for a hundred years. The, the Italian outfit in Chicago is very big on this. When they needed to travel with money, they converted it to diamonds because they could get through the airport, they get whatever they wanted. You could see how small $48,000 is there. Mm -hmm. And without that polyurethane block or whatever that it's in, you can carry $300,000 in your sock. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess from a standpoint, so that's number one, the thing that I think about. And by the way, I'm looking at that as a positive because that could rocket the value of diamonds if there's a standardized format of it where, you know, a lot of times these criminals would convert it to diamonds. This is according to books that I've read, of course. They convert it to diamonds and, you know, they, they'd come back and half of them would be fake and they couldn't tell because they were idiot criminals. Yeah. But you're not going to get that with this product, number one. Number two, since it's so heavily focused in jewelry, there's a trend. I got married four years ago. My wife, you know, she's... She's probably closer to your age than mine or Jimmy's. I mean, yeah, she's younger than me. And she, you know, wanted a diamond ring. But there was a trend among people younger than her where they wanted a house or a car instead. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Gen Z and whoever's after them, they're pretty damn cynical about shit like this. And yeah. I'm curious if you guys have had conversations about the potential for something that is only be only really used in jewelry. You know, it's always, mm -hmm. it's the, the, machine made ones that are used in industry now, right? There's a lot, a lot in there. Yeah. But let me start with, I'll start with the last question and then work my way to the first. Please. So in terms of the engagement ring and maybe people don't want engagement rings that extensive anymore, diamonds are really natural diamonds, are really rare. So the Natural Diamond Council just put out a report. It was actually an ESG report, but in it, they said something really cool. Five carats and above annually in terms of diamonds would only fill a basketball. And all the carrot, all the diamonds mined in the world that are two carats, you know, one to two carats would fill an exercise ball. So we're Man, talking about basketball. You're talking about an NBA ball or a WNBA ball? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, but I'm going to go with NBA. So, you know, these are, these are rare and the supply is diminishing. So I would say for a certain group of people, they maybe lab grown diamonds for engagement rings serve them better because they're the prices are tanking for lab grown diamonds because supply is exploding, right? Anybody, mm -hmm. you know, like 60% of the world's lab grown diamonds are, are manufactured in China and India, and they're just opening up new shops like every week. So they're kind of, it's just tanking. Like they're going to be worth nothing in a couple of years. You're going to see them like on the Amazon being sold. So in terms of that as well, there's always, we believe there's always going to be a distinction between probably people who are wealthy and want the natural stone to preserve wealth and, and you know, have it from an emotional standpoint. And then other people can choose, you know, a lab grown and, and maybe they don't, they don't care about that preservation of capital because that, by that point, lab grown diamonds will come down. You can, De Beers has a light uh, called Lightbox. It's their lab grown division. And they just made an engagement rings a couple of weeks ago. They were released and they have like a two carat engagement ring. That's about $2,500. So, you know, you're looking at a huge price difference between natural and lab grown. And so when people ask us, like, will they be confused or will lab grown overtake natural? Probably we don't think that it will because the prices are going to be so different that it's really going to be two different products. And it's just going to come down to what you want to spend and that emotional component, like what you want and do you want to store. 
a value. And, you know, places like Graf or places like, you know, all the, the big luxury jewelers, Cartier, they'll still have demand from really sure. wealthy people globally for the natural stone, which that supply is diminishing. And in terms so, of kind of the criminal component, quick, I mean, not so much for the everyday, maybe mafia person, but in terms of the, the blood diamonds and everything that went around with those conflicts in Sierra Leone, you know, we, they do have the Kimberly process that was formed. Diamond miners have an organization called the Kimberly process that was formed with the governments where the mine did and also the United Nations. And that's been operating for well over a decade. And they sanctioned those countries or sanctioned those mines and they take that those diamonds um, that are conflict diamonds out of, out of circulation. So is America the only country that puts so much emphasis on the diamond engagement ring or do other cultures and countries do that as well? Um, in Europe, they can use sapphires. You know, I think diamonds in the U.S. are the leading ones. Diamonds in Japan um, are also popular for engagement rings, but they like a smaller diamond where I feel like in the U.S. everybody more like larger, flashier or something. Diamond jewelry, I'm not so sure for engagements, but it's starting to rise um, among the luxury group in China as well. 25% of global diamonds are used oh, in right. the U.S. We're engagement. That's what I meant to engagement. say. Yeah. Okay. Right. It's interesting to me because like we, you know, Amelia, I've known you, I mean, it's got to be close to eight or nine years at this point, 10 years, yeah. something like that. I wish I would have talked to you about this before you came on the show. And I, unfortunately, we haven't talked in a little bit because I, I'm trying to figure out whether, from my perspective, I think demand for your particular bar and coin can almost only go up based on the amount of artificial diamonds that are going to be made, even mm -hmm. if this uh, these younger generations decide that they're not worth it, we're getting the wealth effect through poorer countries, places where yeah. they have never thought of this kind of thing as being something they can own. And as as the, sh the supply of natural diamonds shrinks, you guys become one of the only places where there's a standardized impossible to fool me diamond product. You know, in yeah. other words, I mean, you could go to De Beers and well, let's not call it De Beers, but somebody could buy a $2,500 fake stone. De Beers mm -hmm. goes through three or four pawn shops. The next thing you know, you're paying twelve, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000 for this thing and it's fake. Yeah. And you can actually sit there and say, well, you know, Diamond Standards is one of the only places where you could buy diamonds as an investment and based on the blockchain, it it can't be fixed. Is, yeah. Am I wrong in based saying that? On the, no, I, you're right in saying that. I mean, a big challenge coming up for jewelry shops and pawn shops will be if somebody goes in and sells a diamond, you can't tell by the naked eye, it's lab grown, mm -hmm. so they'll have to have some sort of equipment there like the, the graders do to, to determine that. But, you know, that's all set aside. That's all, we're all audited. You know, everything is, is looked at the, the the standardization process is audited or regulated by a Bermuda Monetary Authority because they're one of the leaders in um, monitoring digital tokens. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we'll probably have in the future that we're working on is a recycling center so people can come in the diamond district to us and a separate facility and sell a diamond back, and you know it'll be priced accordingly. Um, just because we believe in that diminishing, we're going to use so many diamonds to physically back like an ETF, natural diamonds, obviously, that, um, you know, we may need that recycling of above ground diamonds because of the supply. So it's, got, so it's not before, a lot of interesting things. Before we move on to market stuff, can you tell our viewers again how to find out more information about this? Sure. You can go to diamondstandard.co.co. You know, all the information is there. If you want to buy the physical, if you want to buy the fund, um, there's numbers there and, and emails where you can, you know, obviously speak to a salesperson. You can reach out to me as well. I, I can help you through the process. I, I do work in usually more institutional sales, but um, I do work with investors and I, I do market strategies there. So yeah, so it definitely is, it check is, us out. It is store of value, right? Store of value. Yeah, Last question. I know we got to get to the markets, but I, I are you guys subject this to is fascinating as shit. It really me. is. It really <laughs> is. Again, I wish I would have like had an hour call with her beforehand so we could actually talk mm -hmm. about markets. But are you guys under the umbrella of bank secrecy and anti money laundering? Do you guys have that any need for that sort of a regulatory body or no? Yeah, I mean, we ha well, we have a KYC, we have a thorough KYC process, and mm -hmm. you know, we obviously obey all treasury sanctions, things like that. So, yeah, we do have a very thorough KYC process. So you can't just come on and buy this; you'd have to be KYC and everything. So. I I just just a week ago added to my physical gold position because it just it's a mistrust that I have in the stewards yeah. of our currency, and this falls into you know my physical holdings very very well and by the way i have guard dogs and guns too if anyone anyone try to come try to come and even find it 
and try to come and take it. Okay. <laughs> well, it's interesting in having, you know, we haven't really seen a huge shift away in reserve assets from the dollar because there really is no alternative. And I know right. like, China, Russia, Peru, or Brazil are talking about a gold, a physically gold back currency yeah. um, coming up in, in August. They're going to speak about that. But in any event, you know, those things are kind of really slow moving. But obviously, to your point, if you do want assets that are not, you know, under government control, you know, because even the Chinese yuan is managed, right? They have a closed current account. They're, they manage their currency. So you don't want something tied to treasuries or, you know, a political viewpoint, geopolitical viewpoint in the world, then, then gold makes sense, you know, diamonds would make sense. So, you know, having a physically backed commodity would make a lot of sense. Um, I think from that standpoint, to move away from the dollar, if that's your view, and also, um, you know, as a, as a hedge as well, because there's a lot of macro, By the way, macro not, risks out there. Macro risks. I'm not one of these, the dollar's going to shit today thing. I'm not. Yeah. I, no. You know, I don't and actually. I, I, yeah, you I, go. Well, I thought this was a really good segue into markets because Amelia, oh. you have a an amazing resume, FX, global macro strategy. And so I'm curious about your feeling about the recent sort of, I think people ask me more than anything, other than is there a recession? The second question people ask me the most is all these countries, they make it very dramatic, switching away from the dollar mm -hmm. to gold yeah, back currencies, Africa and the BRICS and all that. What do you fall in that? How, how real of a threat? I mean, I know what I think about it. I might know what Jim thinks about it, but I'm really asking you both, starting with Amelia. Where do you guys fall um, in that? I personally don't think that in my lifetime that will happen <laughs> or not in my career lifetime. I do think that there will be a slow migration away from the dollar, but China hasn't opened its you know, capital account yet. It, you know, it's, it's a managed currency. I don't really see an alternative. I mean, obviously when Euro was introduced, you know, I remember working at the Fed when Euro was introduced, um, 98, 99. And, um, you know, that was like, obviously the big thing and it became a reserve asset. And they were like, it, the whole point of it was to like compete with the dollar and overtake the dollar. And because they don't have fiscal union, because they don't, you know, have a common bond market, um, that was never the case. So, you know, it, they're located in obviously in the same region, but, you know, when you start talking about like these bricks, you know, China, Russia, Brazil, they're not even geographically located in the same region. And, you know, let alone fiscal policy. So I think that there's a lot more to manage than it sounds easy, but it's not easy. It's not. I'm not sure I agree with you saying in your lifetime, it's not going to happen that we have a currency crisis, but I believe yeah. it's not going to happen in yours, hard. Jim, which is much shorter. <laughs> it's not going to happen in mine, <laughs> no, but it, might, it might happen in yours. <laughs> um, oh, no. Just because I think the hubris, again, I'm, I'm not saying it's going to happen any time in the next 20 years. But I am, and just to that point is that who would you rather be the referee of the global capital markets game, the United States or China? Um, I think most people would pick China. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, most people would pick the United States, <laughs> despite despite the fact that I think what they did by freezing up Russian assets was a really bad move for the manager of the world reserve currency. I don't. I, I think that that was an awful thing to do, but I don't think anything's going to happen. Um, I think the hubris of having the world's reserve currency just allows this bullshit like MMT to to proliferate more than it normally would have. And it's really a source of frustration to me because like the powers that be know that there's really no alternative to the dollar and they they have beaten the shit out of it and damaged the purchasing power a ton. But there is nothing to take its place. So I don't yeah. think I don't think the dollar's going away anytime in the next 20 years. It's a dollar's exorbitant privilege. We'll continue, right? Exactly. Yes. Robbie, do you agree, Bob? Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, if, from my perspective, I don't like any of that kind of stuff, like war or not. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. The minute that they got taken off a of swift, I'm like, my first reaction was like, what the hell is that? I mean, yeah. we're, we're not even involved in this. And to try and manage the ability of an economy to feed their people, which is basically what that is. Uh, was just troubling regardless of what, what side you're on. I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't even care about that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, it, it, politicians tend to say things like we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I heard Tim Scott say that the other day when uh, somebody, I don't remember who was interviewing him, but said that, you know, 100,000 Americans die from fentanyl and uh, zero Americans have died in Ukraine. So why are we so worried about Ukraine and we're not worried about fentanyl? Um, this particular commentator was trying to get him to say that we should invade Mexico. <laughs> you know, because There's a lot going on here. 
Yeah, Bigold, there's a lot. Mac, Bigold and like macro risks, a lot of geopolitical yeah. stuff out <laughs> there. Yeah, geopolitics is a whole nother thing. Buy diamonds, buy gold. So, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, that's, that's honestly, that's why we go there. We just spent 45 minutes with you talking about preserving wealth in something that we could theoretically put in our pockets. That's why, to me, it excites me so much because there are me parts too. of my brain yeah. that say, I'm going to need to save some of this somewhere that people can't get to it. Another subject. Right. Can I ask you about uh, just the general health of the economy? And I'm going to put it in a way that um, I basically, I'm going to try and make Jimmy wrong in everything I say here. <laughs> so inflation is coming down, still way too high mm -hmm. uh, and coming down. I was listening to Jim Bianco today say that he thinks inflation is bottoming. And mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get him back on so I don't want to go into uh, what he meant by that, or, you know, I heard it and I understood it and I thought it was typical Jim Bianco, which is a positive statement in my mind. He thinks inflation is bottoming and he thinks it's going to start to pick up based on base, base effects and things like that. Then I heard something else. We all know that Jerome Powell is saying that there's going to be pain before inflation can kind of be considered controlled, let's say. Katrina Dudley from Franklin Templeton said today, and it's the first time I've ever heard this, and it really struck me. Jerome Powell says that workers, and I'm, she's paraphrasing, that workers need to suffer, basically. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. There has to be more layoffs, right? She says, I would argue that with stagnant wages over the last decade, they've already suffered. And now mm -hmm. they're getting repaid. And that's why there will be a soft landing. Mm -hmm. Now, we all sit here and say, the Fed, they're idiots. They do everything wrong. Are they right here? Did they do the right thing? Are they getting a soft landing, in your opinion, at this point? I think it's going to be a journey back to the 2% inflation target. You know, I think they were too slow to act at first. Obviously, transitory inflation, which I guess their definition of me to maybe had been like six months. And then the shock came from the Russia-Ukraine war and that exacerbated supply shocks. But, um, you know, I think we're still in the process of adjusting the U.S. services sector. So I think services prices are sticky. I think they're kind of volatile, you know, like kind of you know, people are traveling, they're not traveling, airline expenses. So I, I think that hasn't fully shaken out yet. Ironically, I mean, if the economy soft lands, that would keep like be a stagflationary environment, I would assume, because, you know, not many people would lose their jobs, people would continue spending. And so inflation wouldn't get back to 2%. I don't think in that I think it would be stuck around like three or four. So I don't, you know, that could be problematic. Um, for the Fed, I mean, mortgages aren't adjusting higher, obviously, because with the 30 year fix, no one's presumably selling their place unless they're getting cash for it, a cash buyer right now, because everyone's just going to wait for the rates to come down. You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm hesitant to say only because people, I mean, the consensus, really smart people across banks, across central banks, across in the markets, traders, they've been consistently wrong for almost two and a half years on the inflation and the economic outlook. I, I was mentioning to you before the show that basically late September, October last year, major banks were forecasting Q1 this year was going to be recession and we're not even close to recession. So I think that these surprises are coming up, you know, weak data, then all of a sudden it snaps back strong data. And so um, that's exactly what we saw throughout Q1. And then mini banking crisis. And so kind of like, you know, these shocks are going to rotate and they're going to come up and it's just a matter of, of managing them. And so I think it's just, there's so much uncertainty in my opinion, in macro world, it usually shakes out to the downside. But I mean, obviously the last week that soft landing narrative has been very, very strong. So, I, I mean, I guess it all comes down to the U S employment market. So but my question is this, is that when we look at like the next five years, and, and I, I had been saying for six months that inflation was going to come down. And I, I actually starting to, now that I've been kind of quasi right, not that I, I seriously did not even mean to pat myself on the back there. But now I'm thinking that Jim Bianco, I, I tend to go with Jim Bianco now. There's some things that worry me. The, you, everywhere you look, there's increasing regulation from the governmental standpoint. Ener even energy policy at some point in time, even if we start to you know, have a pickup in economic activity, they, energy prices will probably go higher because of that. Our, our, the other energy producers seem to have an axe to grind with the United States. And I have this feeling when they go back to fill the SPR that Saudis are going to cut production at the same time. When you look at the next five years, do you see the 70s sort of cost push inflation uh, bullshit that we had back then? 
I don't know if we have that same inflation, but I do see higher inflation over the next five years. I do see it being maybe the Fed would even have to shift its inflation target to say two and a half or or three percent even. I do well, see Bobby structural was, things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I see structural things in place are gonna make, you know, changes to I know this is controversial, whatever changes to like ESG and, and things like that, more regulation. Um, you know, just trying to get electronic vehicles right and, and that conversion and how expensive they are. I, I was reading stories this week, I won't mention it wasn't Tesla, but I won't mention the car manufacturer, some of whom I'm seeing a lot in my neighborhood now. They're brand new and they're tens of thousands of dollars to repair basic things. So, you know, like just trying to get that right in the new the new EV market. I don't know, you know, I don't I don't know. And then Will we have a wage price spiral? And, you know, certainly looking at places like the UK and how Brexit has influenced probably their prices, you know, they're in a cost of living crisis. So they have different issues than we have in the United States. But but still, I mean, Europe has a war in its backyard still. Um, it's not ending yet. So I don't know. You know, they had natural gas inventory built up last, last winter and they had a warm winter. Will they have a warm winter again? I don't know. You know so if there's things like that that can impact. No, it's interesting. Yeah, the um Jeffrey Kleintop also, um, I'm reading a lot now because I can't understand why we're not in a recession. I can't understand why jobs are still strong. I really can't. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading a lot of people's stuff to try and get my, my thoughts straight. And Jeffrey Kleintop, who we've, we've had on from Charles Schwab, said, watch out for this weather right now to like seriously damage the economy. He said, one of the things that's happening is waterways, uh, the water levels are getting so low in certain waterways that mm -hmm. the only way to ship things is going to be by truck or rail, which is going to bump yeah. up fuel prices. Yeah. But then the, you know, the counterbalance to that is that if you look at shipping indexes, whether it's the cardboard box index or whether it's the um, Baltic freight index, they're all on, you know, cyclical lows. Mm -hmm. So if we get sort of a, if we get a soft landing and we build on that, I think the Fed cutting, which is what the market right now has priced in for March of next year, Mm -hmm. which after the May meeting, they had it priced in for July. And then they've been slowly getting their Especially thoughts about, straight. Yeah. Yeah, There's like over 150 cut. basis points of cuts priced for next year. Though. Yeah. Yeah. All so. the way down to, to I think it's like three and a half percent on the Fed funds rate, three percent. It doesn't make sense with the soft landing narrative. Like it does if, if consensus is soft landing, then there shouldn't be 150 basis points price next year. Right. So I'm, right, sure. so I'm finding all these things from, and by the way, the, you just mentioned the electric car thing. This is a different subject, but we are actually in my house, we're getting rid of two cars and getting two new cars. We actually mm -hmm. looked at electric cars and the mm -hmm. price difference. We ended up getting a, a hybrid that was $30,000 cheaper than the mm -hmm. only available electric car. And we're about yeah. to get 60 miles a gallon on this thing. Yeah. And this is essentially a work car. There will almost yeah. never be Phillips on this thing. Almost never. Yeah. And, you know, we had Doomberg on who talked about that as well. Oh. I'll have to listen yeah. to that. I like, yeah, yeah I like Dilberg it. was on and he talked about the, just how insincere the climate effort is simply because they should be pushing hybrids because they're more affordable and more people could yep. have them and you'd get a better climate effect. There's a question coming, yeah. I promise. Um, what do you think that the economy or, or the sort of people who are looking at global macro and are investing in stocks, where do you see mm -hmm. the biggest risk and where do you see, or do you see any risk? for those people that are now heavily involved yeah. in stocks. Well, obviously AI, is, it's been the shiny ball, right? Shiny ball, yeah. AI. <laughs> so I don't know how long, not how long AI can last, but how long that shiny ball and these, you know, super high valuations and it, can that continue? I mean, I'm a macro trader, right? So I'm, I'm a doomsday prepper by nature. So I look for what can go wrong because normally I, I feel like normally dislocations, which is a downside, not to the up, that's been, over the course of my career. And so, um, you know, over the last three years, we've suffered as a globe so many exogenous shocks that like we didn't, nobody saw it coming. And so, and once they happened on the other side of them, no one could kind of figure out what exactly market market and economic impacts would be. And kind of everybody was wrong. It's a fluid situation. Everyone's constantly adjusting forecasts and pricing and this. And so, you know, I would just have an uncorrelated portfolio. I would just, you know, maybe it's not your whole portfolio, but I would definitely have hedges on and I would definitely have assets that are uncorrelated, safe haven assets. And people ask me like, why? Because like, you know, 
you know, you're not in a risk off environment because NASDAQ's up like 37% this year. And so in my mind, macro themes, they simmer in the background. We've talked about a lot of them, but when they rotate to the forefront, they become vicious. And so, you know, and they're instant and it's too late to do something then. And so I would always kind of have something on because over the last three years, it's been really hard to judge when those are going to rotate to the front. Bobby, so volatility has come down so low. Options are cheap. Every yeah. time I think about taking profit on some of the core longs that I've had, I just say, why? I can just buy a couple months of 5% out uh, puts, which I did again today. Um, what are your thoughts? Are you, are you a bull the stock market? Or are you a bull with caution? I'm, I'm a bull trader, but I'm not a bull investor. And I, I think you're right. I think that's underappreciated. Um, insurance is for sale right now in a very mm-hmm. big way, in a very, mm-hmm. very big way. My biggest fear of all this, which is part of the reason I wanted to have Amelia on it so quickly, is that the next collapse, if we don't end up in a recession this time, we have the issue that Amelia brought up where they're probably going to have to accept a higher inflation rate. And we've been we've had a 2% target for so long, I don't even think they know how to work it. I keep bringing up this, this subject that somewhere in the range of like 47%, of the S&P uh, chief investment officers for the companies and the CFOs uh, have never worked in a C-suite with rates above like a half percent. Yeah. And they're operating and, and they're running companies never having understood money having a cost, right? Which we've all been around at the times when it did. So, you know, looking at something like, like gold or, or even diamonds, which I'm definitely going to take very seriously, I suspect the next big downturn um, is going to be insanely big if we don't actually get this recessionary correction now. In other words, looking out 2025, 2026, you better own diamonds. You better own gold. Um, I mean, am I crazy, Amelia? Do you? Do you see where I'm getting no, that from? No, I, I do. I mean, I, I guess over the pandemic, you know, well, I, I know over the pandemic, we have numbers that there was a bifurcation, right, in terms of the wealth effect. And so, Amen. yeah, and so richer got a lot richer. It did have some middle class impacts, too. Um, there were more employment because people left the you know, the, the employment. They didn't want to come back to work. But then other people moved into those slots. And so... Um, you know, I guess the biggest threat, I think, glo- globally comes from like the collapse of that, the luxury market, you know, not just luxury goods, but I'm saying the very high net worth people, should they stop and should they start stop traveling? Because I think, I just think because I, maybe I'm biased because we're here in Florida, Bobby, but, um, you know, all the tourism, all the money you see, like yeah. Miami's on fire and the prices and the international tourists and everybody, you know, I think if that money stops being spent to that extent, then that's going to impact all the way down, you know, the chain, unfortunately. So I, and I don't know what event would necessarily bring that about, but um, that would be the one that I think would be harmful. So I'm a, okay. I I agree. it seems to me that I agree more with the yield curve than you guys do. I think a recession in the next two quarters. Amelia, oh, okay. a short answer, yes or no? You think that's okay or no? In the next two quarters, um, yeah, I would say like I would say Q4, Q1 of 2024. That's what I would say. But what so about I'm you, Bobby? Well, I'm I'm hesitant to put like to say when because we don't know until after it's done. You know, right. I mean, we yeah, well, we've got yeah. the National Bureau of Economic Unless Research tells us afterwards that we were in a recession, yeah. whereas Europe but, still operates yeah. under like the IMF and the World Bank saying it's two consecutive quarters of negative growth. I think it's weird that I think like expectations globally haven't adjusted outside the U.S. I feel like people are yeah. paying so much attention to the U.S. economy, but they're not really paying attention to it relative like the other economies relative to the U.S. And it was so fun. I mean, it's weird. We got that dollar decline. Um, last week, pretty steep. But when you look at the U.S. relative to like Europe or the U.K., it's like, well, we're not doing worse than they are. So, so this is my last question. I I can't see the settlement on the euro right now. My screen's not updating. I, but I if the euro was positive today in the cash markets, it would have been up nine consecutive days, which would be the longest streak going all the way back to 2004. Yeah. Um, does that kind of thing matter? Like, is this a seismic shift in the euro US dollar relationship, or is it just simply because the ECB is behind in their inflation fight because their inflation? I think it's more, yeah. 
I think it's more that the ECB is behind in their inflation because they are, you know, we're going to have that. What is that big conference at the end of the summer that everybody goes to? Um, oh, uh, Jackson Hole? Yes, Jackson Hole. Yeah, Jackson so, Hole. I mean, everyone's going to speak there. And so that'll probably set the tone into the year end. I bet they'll have some, you know, kind of big things to say. But as much as people talk about the dollar being weak, and it obviously weakened a lot last week, but, um, you know, euros like one twelve thirty. It's not up at like one twenty five. So I mean, it's not yeah. the dollar's not like no, that right, right. weak, right? So I mean, just last October, um, BOJ intervened, and you know, we went sub one thirty eight last week on dollar yen, but um, the Ministry of Finance verbally intervened the week before that once again. So you know, the dollar's not not that weak. Relatively it was funny speaking. when I looked at it. I was like, oh my god, it's nine days straight. It must be at really high levels, highest level since <laughs> February. It's no big deal. <laughs> but yeah. Bobby, to put some to put a finer point on that too, in the UK, and I know you said the euro, but the UK yeah. the pound, which is up four percent in this month alone, um, their last reading on inflation in the end of June was eight point seven, up from an expected eight point one in CPI year over year. Ours was three from an expected three point one. We're in very very different worlds regarding inflation. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. JP Morgan just came out again today said. There are scenarios that they could see that would have the terminal short-term rate for the Bank of England up to 7%, which I think, you know, so that, I mean, that's, that's again, yeah. we're talking about a, just a sh seismic shift in getting back to them fighting the inflation that they should have been fighting before when we started earlier. In the yeah. Month. Andrew My Bailey opinion. has, Andrew Bailey, their central bank governor has really mismanaged um that economy, I would say. But um, anyway, yeah, I, I guess for the U.S., you know, we just see elevated bond market volatility constantly. And right. it's so fluid. It just shifts almost with like every tier one data release. And, you know, that's driving gold, too. That's driving the dollar. They're moving with that bond market, you know, volatility. Yeah. One day it's soft landing. One day, oh, no, it's hard landing. Now we're back to inflation. And, you know, you just have that constant bond market volatility because the Fed is data dependent and therefore, the markets have become data dependent. But I did not suspect this to be <laughs> as interesting a conversation about yeah. diamonds, which is something I think is so, so cool. And I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm.